William the Conqueror is potentially the most important figure in all of European history. His actions directly impacted the language, culture, religion, and growth of a nation that ended up nearly conquering the entire world. His descendants would become crusaders and kings, they would fight wars lasting hundreds of years, and they would go out and colonize the new world. Now you could make an argument that all of this would have happened with or without William, but the fact of the matter is that he played a major role in the development of Europe and therefore the entire world. But before we get into that, make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel. Also, be sure to check out my website, mrstockford.com, where I post tons of articles about this exact content. In fact, this very video is based on an article I wrote several months ago. That's enough shameless plugging, let's get back to William. By the time we get to the year 1066, William held the title of the Duke of Normandy, which I'll explain a little bit later in this video, but for now, just know that Normandy is a region of the north of France, right along the coastline. William's life as the Duke of Normandy was pretty awesome, but he wanted even more. Specifically, he wanted to be a king. Even more specifically, he wanted to be the King of England. Lucky for William, the sitting King of England, Edward the Confessor, died without a clear heir to the throne. Unlucky for William, everybody tried to claim it. In all this confusion, Edward's brother-in-law, Harold, took the throne. Shortly thereafter, the King of Norway invaded from the east, trying to take the throne from Harold, but Harold's forces defeated him. At this point in time, things were looking pretty good for good old Harold. But immediately after his victory over the Norwegian king, William, knowing that Harold's forces were weakened, invaded from the south. Harold and his forces forces went to the south to meet William in battle, but he had to leave a considerable amount of his army behind in order to guard the cities from other Norwegian attacks or raids. This meant that Harold was extremely understaffed by the time he got to the battle, even though he technically had the military numbers to wipe William's army out. Because he made the decision to leave so many people behind to guard the cities, Harold lost the Battle of Hastings to William, and actually died in the process. With Harold and his army out of the way, William goes from just being the Duke of Normandy to King William I of England, also known as William the Conqueror. It was far from smooth sailing after William's victory at the Battle of Hastings. The easy part of his plan was beating Harold. The hard part was maintaining his control over his new kingdom. It's sort of like that scene from Monty Python and the Holy Grail where King Arthur is trying to convince the peasants that he is in fact their king and has authority over them, and all the peasants are like, Well, I didn't vote for you! Imagine that, but the peasants are armed and willing to fight you to the death. In order to further establish his dominance, William chose the highest hill in the area of London and built a giant castle on top of it. This castle, by the way, is now called the Tower of London, despite it not really being a tower. Side note, nearby that tower, and significantly later on in history, a giant, beautiful bridge was built. Everybody calls this bridge London Bridge, and everybody is wrong. This bridge is called Tower Bridge, and now that you know what it's actually called, the expectation is that you get it right or I will openly judge you. There are a lot of reasons as to why William, but possibly the most significant reason is William's use of the castle. You see, contrary to popular belief, most castles aren't actually a fancy palace that people lived in. In fact, many castles were actually meant to be military fortifications. William's castles were almost all built on a hill, and if there wasn't much of a hill around, they would make one. William's greatest innovation of the castle was restricting access to the building itself. This was usually accomplished by building high walls, using choke points, digging moats, or even a combination of any of those ideas. By building their castles on hills, surrounded by walls, moats, and choke points, William's forces gave themselves Obi-Wan Kenobi's favorite advantage. I have the high ground! Having the high ground gave William's forces a number of bonus advantages. First and foremost, they could actually see the enemies coming from a significantly further distance. This in turn gave them more time to make better preparations for the oncoming attack. It also meant that any forces trying to take the castle had to fight a literal uphill battle. It's already pretty difficult for a number of us to walk up a steep hill, but having to do so while dodging arrows, spears, rocks, and anything else would make it nearly impossible. Another advantage of using castles as a military fortification meant you could store up a large amount of resources inside, allowing you to prepare for sieges. Let's go ahead and take a look at an example. This is more than just a fun picture of me and a friend in the stocks at Cardiff Castle. This is also a prime example of one of William the Conqueror's castles. As you can see in the background, the building itself is not actually that large. It also sits up on top of a steep hill which, given the rest of the landscape, is probably artificial. Not visible in this picture is the wide moat which also surrounds the castle and is only crossable by going up those steep steps which act as a choke point. The only way in or out of this castle is through those stairs, which are pretty easily defended. And that's all if you can even make it to the castle. The entire grounds of this fort are surrounded by a great wall, making it nearly impossible to get through in the first place. 
What may surprise you the most about William the Conqueror is that even though he desperately wanted to be the King of England and he fought really hard to gain and maintain that kingdom, he uh, didn't want to live there. You see, William was a Norman. The Normans were a group of Anglo-Saxons who had settled in the northern region of France along the coast. Over time, the Normans adopted many French customs and even the French language, but also stayed pretty independent. And even though they were under the rule of the King of France, they were allowed a fair amount of autonomy under the Duke of Normandy. The English citizens now under William's control did not like the fact that they were being ruled by a Norman, aka Anglo-Saxon, aka kind of French person who didn't even speak their own language, let alone live in their country. And if you think this all sounds like a recipe for disaster, you're right. These concerns that the English citizens had ended up leading to many rebellions, which William had to crush with military power. Because of all of these rebellions, William ended up just leaving a bunch of soldiers to patrol all the major cities. And as everyone knows, the way to win a rebellious people's heart is by leaving soldiers all over their neighborhoods. To make matters worse, because William was a Norman, aka Anglo-Saxon, aka kind of French person, when he died, there was a huge argument about who should actually take his throne, an Englishman or a Frenchman. You see, as I mentioned, Normandy enjoyed a sort of independence, but it was under the rule and purview of the King of France. The King of France essentially was in charge, but allowed the Duke of Normandy to govern as he saw fit. This meant that the Duke of Normandy directly reported to the King and was underneath the King in authority. This is why William was just the Duke of Normandy and not the King, and why he wanted the title of King of England. On top of that, William was somewhat related to the French royalty. And while that didn't give William a claim to the French throne, it did give the French royalty enough reason to try and claim the English throne. After all, the Duke of Normandy is supposed to be under the King of France, and so if the Duke of Normandy is also the King of England, that would mean that the King of England is under the King of France. But to make all of this mess even worse, because William did hold the title of King, he kind of saw that as raising himself up to the same level as the King of France, which kind of makes him both less than and equal to the French King at the same time. All of this is basically to say that even though England was never ruled by France, their leaders were French. And if you think this sounds like a second recipe for disaster, you'd also be right. Over the next 300 or so years, these two royal positions became even more intertwined, and claims to the throne became even more ambiguous. All of this confusion culminates in a conflict when both English and French royalty make a solid claim for the French throne, and end up fighting in what we call the Hundred Years' War, even though it lasted 116 years. To give you an idea of the gravity of the situation, this rivalry lasted in the form of legitimate military conflicts all the way through the colonial era. In fact, the final armed conflict between England and France happened in 1898 when both countries tried to exert control over Sudan. This rivalry even continues to this day, albeit mostly in the form of jokes and insults rather than armed military conflict. For example, you've probably heard jokes about how Napoleon Bonaparte was super short, or how the French armies always surrender. This is all British propaganda as part of this rivalry. Napoleon Bonaparte was actually average height, and the French military have one of the strongest victorious records in history. And this entire rivalry only exists because some kind of French person decided he wanted to be the King of England. 